Many thanks, Sheila. Hello and welcome. Welcome to this first in a series of three events that we're running this year, uh, hosted by the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, the Royal Irish Academy is Ireland's leading body of experts in the sciences and humanities on the island of Ireland. I'm Mary Cowan. I'm the director of the Geological Survey of Northern Ireland. And this event is organized by members of the Geoscience and Geographical Sciences Committees, together with our colleagues on the Climate Change and Environmental Science Committees. So we work together to ensure and bring this, this first in our series of sustainability focus uh, for this year. This event is supported by both geological surveys on the island of Ireland and UNESCO. And as, you, as you've seen, is hosted by the Royal Irish Academy. Geosciences has been brought into focus, particularly in the last 10 years, sharp focus under the lens of climate change, environmental change, sustainable development, the energy transition and clean growth. And our guest speaker this evening, Ian Stewart, has spent some time deep in thought about what this means for geoscience and how it needs to repurpose itself and its value to society. Ian is the El Hassan Research Chair in Sustainability at the Royal Scientific Society based in Jordan, where he's coming from this evening. He's co-director of the Centre for Climate Change and Sustainability at Ashoka University, India, and professor of geoscience communication at the University of Plymouth. He's the founding director of Plymouth's Sustainable Earth Institute, and his long-standing research interests include natural hazards, sustainable geoscience, and earth science communication. His, geo his geocommunication work has been built on a 15-year partnership together with the BBC Television, presenting a whole series of, of, of programmes, including BAFTA award-winning Earth, the Power of the Planet, Earth, the Climate Wars, How Earth Made Us, How to Grow a Planet, and the Rise of the Continents, and was recently academic advisor on the BBC's acclaimed landmark series, Seven Worlds, One Planet. He was awarded an MBE for his services to geography and geology education. He's the current president of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society and was communications lead and evidence chair to the Scottish government's Climate Citizens Assembly. He's a global champion of earth science and he holds the UNESCO chair in geoscience and society and leads a UNESCO international geoscience programme on geology and sustainable development. So we're absolutely delighted that he's here with us this evening and our guest speaker on this inaugural uh, uh, lecture as part of this uh, three-part series. And it, his talk is entitled Selling Planet Earth, Repurposing Geoscience for Sustainable Human Wellbeing. Over to you, Ian. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to... Um... To be with you all uh, tonight, even if I am beaming in from uh, from, uh, from uh, Jordan, from the from the desert, it doesn't feel very much like a desert here at the moment. So um, I think what I'll do is uh, um, just let me just get onto the slide, and I'll I'll talk you into um, the plan, really the plan of attack. So Mari outlined the um, the title of Selling Planet Earth, because, you know, that's really what I've been doing for the last 20 years and the different guys he's trying to talk about, to take to the public and to, to wider, you know, to politicians, to anyone who will listen really about geoscience, geology, earth science, whatever we're going to call it, the planet really, and, and how, how it works and why it's important to us. And, um, and really during over that journey, I think early on, it was very much of a geology, rah, rah, rah. Isn't that amazing, the planet? And, you know, there still is lots of elements of that. And, and then sort of towards the end, starting to get into more nitty gritty issue around energy. I did a series of what called Planet Oil. I did a documentary on fracking. And it was really around that time when I started to sense a shift, both in my thinking and also I think the wider thinking of, that, that geology was becoming increasingly seen as not the solution in the way that I saw it, but the problem. And, and it made me think that, you know, when I went through, I went through in the late 80s, about, well, 82 to 86 was my undergraduate, 86 to 90 was my PhD. But really at that time, geology was, you know, the science for the late 20th, 20th century. It was, a, it was a science of discovery and how do, how do we drive 
development, human development through economic growth. So my, my friends, most of my friends went into mining or they went into oil and gas. And it was, it was a great boom time for, for geologists. And so we didn't really have to think too much about what geology was and what its role and responsibility was. But I think just really in the last five years, uh, particularly, I think there's been a, an almost identity crisis in, in geology because we've we realized that these great bastions of geoscience of the mineral ex, you know, extraction and, uh, and fossil fuel um, energy are now kind of laid at the door of this, this um, climatic ecological crisis that we're now uh, looking into the face of. And, and, and suddenly all of these issues around sustainability, which was never you know, taught in my undergraduate degree, and, and indeed, even when my teaching, when I was teaching students, we really, we wouldn't touch on sustainability or sustainable development, was coming to the fore. And so geology, I think, was getting seen as this 20th century science in the 21st century. And as many of you know, there were, uh, there's a knock-on effect with many departments uh, struggling with numbers, not just in the UK, but in, there's been culls in Australia, across Europe, and in particular around energy courses and petroleum geoscience courses. So all of that, I, I started a... Um, Institute for a Sustainable Earth Institute uh, about five years ago at Plymouth and really that's when I've started to, to try to get into sustainability. So this talk really is to kind of take you through the journey that I've gone through, not personal journey, but a journey through sustainability. What does that actually mean, sustainable development? And what, one of the things I'm going to try to convince you of is that geology has got a real deep profound contribution to make to the breadth of sustainability, not just the certain sections of it that seem to conform to the bits of geology that we, we know and love, which might be to do with energy geoscience or to do with um, uh, economic geology, et cetera. But actually it's about the way we think about that thing that I'm holding uh, the, the, the planet. Um, so, so the first thing to uh, emphasize really, I guess, is that sustainability or sustainability thinking isn't uh, new. This is from Tertullian in the second century AD, and I'm not expecting you to read all of this, but what's interesting is how the narrative that Tertullian is bringing out here is very similar to the narrative that we have today. So, so he talks in the first line about when he looks at the whole world, it is becoming daily better cultivated, more fully people, uh, all places been accessible, etc. And then he goes on to chart a, a litany of woes really about the planet. And as, as we get down the third sentence from that third line from the bottom, our numbers are burdensome to the world, we can hardly supply us from its, uh, which can hardly supply us from its natural elements, our wants grow more and more keen, and our complaints more bitter than all mouths, whilst nature fails in affording us her usual sustenance. So this is about a, a humanity outliving its natural means, and yet we're talking about something that was almost 2,000 uh, years ago. And, but, but those same feelings of us, you know, outlying, outliving the, or out, um, uh, you know, taken away from the natural capital, the, the landscape and the natural resources, is, uh, is certainly the thing that underpins sustainability. So I guess, you know, catching up on it, when sustainability really comes in as a concept that you can think about in relation to the modern day, it's, it's around about in the 18th century when we have a large scale land clearances, forest clearances across Europe um, for a whole bunch of reasons, but, but some of it is fuel for, uh, for uh, coal, but also to provide, uh, you know, wood for a whole set of reasons. And it's kind of the first, you know, fuel or energy crisis. Um, but of course, it's around that time, certainly the late, latter part of the, 20, the, the 18th century, that geology starts to emerge. James Hutton in particular, that, um, and the, the theory of the earth that really is the first seminal um, tome of, of how geology is a, can be a scientific uh, set of inquiry. And this line appears, I think, in the second paragraph of the opening page. You know, this globe of the earth is a habitable world and on its fitness for this purpose, our sense of wisdom and its formation must depend. In other words, to my mind, that is at the heart of the Scottish Enlightenment time of prog human progress, advancing human progress, and that understanding the planet is fundamental to advance that, that, that human progress. And I kind of think, I guess a subtext of this is that we, we've slightly lost the sense 
of what the purpose of geoscience is because we haven't had to think about it for some time and now we're getting forced to and and it's quite a, a difficult thing to suddenly just start doing um, of course, the 19th century really that, that follows on from this is all, you know, is driven by geology, it's driven by mining, it's uh, for, for metals and things like that, it's driven by, by uh, uh, fossil fuels, first of all coal, and then in the, as we go into the 20th century, oil and gas. And, but the main thing is this, this notion that the, the earth is our resource base that this is what humanity can delve into in order to, to progress itself. And I love this quote from Thomas Carlyle, we remove mountains and make seas our smooth highway. Nothing can resist us. We war with rude nature and by our resistless engines come off always victorious and loaded with spoils. So this is the industrial revolution at full pelt, really transforming landscapes and of course transforming society and giving huge wealth to, to the UK, to Britain, to, to Europe, etc., cetera, and, and driving empires around the world. So that's all in a way looking at the, the way that it was set up in terms of the, the drive for this unsustainable process based around indirectly, let's say, geological endeavor. I think the way that we look at sustainability now is probably something that really comes from, from the 70s onwards. And you know, this is the classic uh, photograph from Bill Anders at Apollo 8 from, you know, on the spacecraft, from the moon, looking back at the planet and, you know, that pale blue dot, that sense of, of vulnerability and isolation that that is our world and it's the only one that we've got. And so we better look after it. And, and really from the late 60s, accelerating, accelerating into the, the 70s, we have a real rise of environmental uh, consciousness. Um, a key moment, I think, is in April the 22nd, um, 1970, when the first Earth Day was put together. Now, this was put together by students. You might imagine in the late 60s, early 70s, the student body in the US was a very vibrant, active group campaigning against the Vietnam War, civil rights, etc. But in this particular day, starting to campaign for about, about the environment. So you got a whole bunch of youngsters and campuses across the world. And here it is in, uh, in New York you know, campaigning about what the, the things that we were doing to the, to the planet. But those, that, uh, those campaigns picked up by certain people in the media, and a particular one was Walter Cronkite, then regarded as the, the, as the most trusted man in America, who devoted his full-length uh, full uh, evening show to the Earth Day, in which he has this statement, the foul skies, the filthy waters, the littered earth, the unanimous voice of the scientists warning that halfway measures and business as usual cannot possibly pull us back from the edge of the precipice. And again, it's, it's very difficult to look at that and read that and not think of us rushing up to, the, to you know, last November at COP when we had the, you know, the youngsters in the streets, the students in the streets, and you had people like David Attenborough standing up and saying, you know, the, the, the highly respected media people saying, we've got to listen to the scientists, this is our last chance. And yet, of course, the irony isn't lost. There's 50 years of difference in between. And what has happened then in that 50 years? So the, the 70s and with this emergence of consciousness, um, also in terms of the scientific understanding, um, one of the first acts in 68, the Club of Rome invited Donella Meadows and Dennis Me Meadows and a, and a group to start using the first computer models to start trying to think about modeling the future of, of humanity in terms of resource needs and, and population, etc. And they produced their Limits to Growth paper in, in 1972. It was widely disregarded by uh, econom economists and, and other people who really contested the fundamental. Uh, premise and the fundamental premise was that that population the dates have just uh, fallen off there but is is that after around about 2020 the population would would peak would uh, and but as that goes to that peak the rise in industrial uh, output and the rise in pollution and a diminishment of resources would end up being a natural limit really on the um, on the population and its ability to feed itself and the humanity or would go into, or civilization really, would go into decline. Now, despite it being um, really rejected and widely criticized at the time, the subsequent reviews of this over the last uh, decade or so has pretty much 
indicated that the basic elements were pretty much on the button. In other words, that actually at a meta level, this is a, a, a kind of narrative that uh, it's got a really a lot of a weight to it. But the point was that really within the academic world, this was starting to, to rise up. Now, I'm going to skip a decade, uh, really jump forward to the Brundtland Commission, which was uh, the Norwegian um, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, uh, chaired on our common future. And that gave us really a, the first broad definition of sustainable development, which has been, been widely used and still forms a kind of the benchmark for the way that we think of, of uh, sustainable development. And that is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this notion of intergenerational uh, justice, and that is being kind of subbed down, if you like, to this notion of long-term well-being for all. Uh, uh, and that's a, a kind of an, an easy sort of way to think about what we're actually meaning about, about sustainable development. So the way that that starts to get formulated is, is quite interesting because, you know, development and sustainability are in tension with each other. It's, in fact, it's, it's argued that it's possibly an oxymoron. You cannot have sustainable development because any kind of development has to take away from the natural resource base and therefore you diminish that. The way that that was understood really was in various guises, but you'll see the three circles the, or the three pillars, this idea of the social, in other words, social development, uh, of human well-being, economic development, economic growth, and the environment. And that sustainability was the mutual overlap between all of those three. And, and there was this notion of kind of what was referred to as, as, as weak sustainability. In other words, that as long as you can, as long as they were broadly in balance, then it was okay. In other words, you could have one of those circles slightly larger, um, for example, the economy, and the other ones less, if, as long as they ultimately all kind of balanced out. So it was okay to take from the environment if you were driving economic growth, because economic growth was seen as the thing that actually delivered well-being. So the, the environment became the casualty, but actually if, if well-being was achieved, then that was kind of okay. So there was this notion, grow first, clean up later, you know, get your economy there, and then you can take care of some of these other things. The, there's a, one of the nested set of circles suggests a slightly different philosophy on this, where the economy sits within society which sits within the environment. So there's this notion then starting to melt around about that time of the environment being the base of, of all of this and that society and economy are coming into that. And Forum for the Future, Jonathan Porritt's group produced uh, um, this idea of capitals, different kind of capitals that economists were starting to come out with. And, and he put this together, you know, that manufactured capital, financial capital were the, the products of the economy, social capital, human capital, so education and health and things like that was part of the, um, the middle part. But all of that rested on natural capital uh, underneath. And those, those uh, phrases, those terms are really are very much still, still with us. So one of the subtlety battles is getting played out here is, is really what's the role of the environment? It's just, is it just a subsidiary that's supplying stuff to the society and to the economy, or is it fundamentally important in its own, its own right? Now, I think a really important contribution came from this guy. This is Herman Daly. He was the uh, economist, chief economist with the World Bank, and then he uh, retired and took up a, a chair at the University of Maryland. And he, he was interested in the flows of, you know, how do you, it's all very well all these nested circles, but how does things flow from one area to another area? And he, um, this was re-conceived uh, really by Donella Meadows uh, a couple of decades later as this triangle, Daly's triangle. And what you can see there is that what, he, what Daly says is, look, everything depends on the ultimate means. That is the natural capital. So the energy from the sun, the biosphere, the basic earth materials, the raw materials, the basic biochemical cycles. If that stops, everything stops. So we get everything from those ultimate means. And from those ultimate means, science and technology in particular, turns that into intermediate means, stuff that we then use to build other things. So labor tools, you'll see some of it there. And th those raw materials, raw industrial materials, then get, get transformed by a political economy into you know, health services, wealth, leisure, 
and knowledge, communications, and, and all the consumer goods that we, that we think about as part of the, uh, the products of, of, our, um, of a kind of capitalist economy. But the important thing is that he was saying, people think of you know, uh, wealth and things like that as, as the end game, but, of, but he was saying that's not the end game. That there's an, the ultimate end is well-being, is human well-being. And, and that gets interpreted in lots of different ways, but you can see some of the there. And happiness, harmony, identity. And the point is that, that actually there's now indices for well-being and people can define it uh, in, in all sorts of ways and actually measure things against it. But then that shouldn't take away from the fact that that is the ultimate thing. In other words, if you think about it yourself, you know, you go to work and you get, you, you do a job and you get paid, but that pay, pay package at the end of the month or something doesn't define your well-being, your happiness. It's what you do with that money, the other activities that make your life worthwhile. And so what Daly was doing was saying, you know, these are the important uh, aspects. And so theology and ethics and things like that, um, a very different set of different uh, disciplines really come in at that point. So that was one way of an economist looking at it. Um, this is another way, and this is the way that really took hold. This is Milton Friedman, who was the kind of doyen, really, of the Chicago School of Economists, so a free market uh, economist, who, who basically we say, said, you, you've got to separate the, the economy from the political system. Um, and, and it really came out in, you know, in a way, arguably, we're seeing it on our television screens tonight. He was saying, you know, if you have... Um, the economic well-being in the hands of a few people, then basically wealth can get get um, you, you know all, taken out and and uh, and not spread around. So the way you do that is you have a free market. You have lots and lots of corporations and companies. You require them to have shareholders. You make sure the profit goes from those in, in charge down through the shareholders, and that then will percolate down through society. And it's this notion really of of a kind of, uh, a, you know, the trickle down economics. So in Milton Friedman's world, and, and this really was the, the economic paradigm that captured the, the second half of the 20th century, business, the, it becomes the engine room of well-being. So basically the economy is the most effective way to deliver social well-being. You create wealth, yes, some people got richer and richer, but wealth will find its way, will trickle down to the bottom and will raise the bottom up. And so that's the most efficient way of delivering well-being. And if you don't do that, you have to do it politically. And that, if you're going to redistribute wealth, that's essentially socialism. And of course, he was obviously very much against that. So, and there's good evidence uh, and, and lots of uh, very, um, you know, robust, academic terms have been written about that the fact that the world has become a better place and, and many of the indices that we've got for human well-being have improved dramatically really over the course of the, the, um, the 20th century as a result, a result of this trickle-down economics, this rising tide that lifts all boats and so there's a, so work by Stephen Pinker and Hans Rosling there, a whole um, set of lectures really looking at the evidence that on almost any basis you look at, you know, GDP, global wealth, if you like, has increased uh, through the, the 20th century. But, but the also the notion is that other things have, uh, have come as a result of that. So when we start looking at goals, global goals for development, what we see is that development, you know, this tension I was saying between sustainability and development, development really has, is, the, is the one that takes the lead. If we can just make countries richer through business development, industrial development, then that'll make it way down to the, to the, uh, to the individuals and to populations. And that will be the things that will drive, you know, the eradication of poverty and hunger, uh, it will increase education, gender equality. You can see the Millennium Development Goal listed there. And there were eight goals. And you can see that the environment, sustainability, if you like, but the environment was one of them. It was number seven to protect the, protect the environment and all that. But it's certainly the, the, the subsidiary to the, the broader set of, of uh, development goals. So you see the dates there, up, they run from 2000 to 2015. And towards the end, in that period, people started to reassess um, what the main narratives were around uh, sustainability. And I think this is where geologists and earth scientists really step in. To, to my mind, the arguments that have been put forward thus far have largely been driven by uh, economists 
and, and a lot of uh, environmentalists, but geologists haven't really been involved in it up until till, uh, to this point. Partly because you could argue we've been, you know, busy finding the stuff that's kept the modern world going. But we all know really that at some point, uh, and we can debate what that date is or that period is, we moved from the Holocene, the, the period where climate was what dictated the limits of, of uh, civilization, into a point where humans themselves actually had the capacity to change their world to such an extent that they that we were in a that humans were a geological agent, moving more material than nature, uh, you know, affecting the chemistry of the deep oceans, of the uh, the distant atmosphere, etc. And that was was the Anthropocene. And this is a, a pretty fundamental uh, transition. Some people have it way back when we start with rice agriculture thousands of years ago. Um, many people have it at the start of the Industrial Revolution, that mechanical age that I mentioned. Um, and for a lot of people, it really comes in the post-war uh, economic boom. And, um, and there's a whole, whole different talk, um, not from me, but from stratigraphers about where you would put the limits of that Anthropocene. The, the photograph at the bottom is, is a photograph I took up in the Altiplano of Bolivia. And it's those amazing salt flats. I mean, that is, that is probably the most beautiful place I've ever been. Uh, extraordinary UNESCO World Heritage uh, Site. And yet, um, home to 30% of the world's lithium reserves. And lithium, the lightest of the metals, absolutely critical element in renewables. Uh, and, and uh, you know, for electric vehicles, for example, that is not an electric vehicle there. That's a, that's a petrol driven vehicle. But if we're going to transition into electric vehicles, then the, the danger is that we're going to have to dig up some of these places in order to get the lithium in order to, to drive this. So, so the, the shift from the Holocene into the Anthropocene is bringing with it huge ethical, moral questions, which go beyond just the scientific and technical comprehension of, of the, the geology. It's also around about this time, 90, uh, around about 2000, that Paul Crutz then defines this idea of the geology of mankind, the human age, the Anthropocene. So we we first have this notion of geologists kind of reasserting themselves as being key players in the way that we look at the future of the planet. I have to say for most geologists that I remember at the time, thought this was a load of rubbish it was just a, a kind of bandwagon that people were jumping on. Um, but actually, pretty, and, and it was more cultural theorists that thought it was a really neat way of looking at things. Uh, but pretty quickly, um, you know, the idea of the Anthropocene has, has been taken on board and, and it's now a familiar point of discussion in geology departments around the world, really. Um, but this is what the Anthropocene really means, I think, in, in reality. This is from um, Will Steffens' and, uh, paper, with co-authors in 2004, when they, they looked at the indices of change uh, in the human system, if you like, on the left in red, and the natural system, showing that you'll see the dashed line from 1950 there, that there's a in, there's an inflection point in human progress, human activity, human output, by which population steps up, GDP steps up, and just about every index of production steps up. But you can see the cost of that. You can see the environmental effects of that in terms of carbon dioxide, other types of atmospheric gases, looking at surface temperature, ocean acidification, food uh, capture, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we're seeing then is we're seeing that uh, even if it's indirectly driven by geology, that this drive for economic growth and material consumption, which is producing the change on the left, has this counter effect a, a great acceleration, the sociologists refer to the, the left-hand side as a great acceleration, but it's a, a great acceleration and decline of the, um, the health, really, of, of natural systems, the well-being of the planet, if you like, getting being negatively affected by this. So what that then focuses attention, really, on the planet at a planetary scale. How is it working how is its coping mechanisms? How is its, its rhythms, its thresholds? And that, that systems thinking that geology's kind of always had, but really, really comes to the fore. So this is um, Johan Rockstrom at the uh, Stockholm Brazilian Center and, and colleagues like Tim Lenton and Exeter start to play around with this idea of planetary boundaries. And, and so this is a 
formulation from 2009, an audit, if you like, for the well-being of the planet. So looking at the different aspects, the different threats, the different parts of the planetary system that are under threat, and basically judging whether they're within healthy limits, probably just outside or dangerously outside. And you'll see from this that two particular areas, biosphere and integrity, so if you like uh, biodiversity loss, and then biochemical uh, flows, particularly nitrogen, but also um, uh, phosphorus, um, are seen as being kind of dangerously out of kilter and becoming a problem. And we've got other areas that are starting to look like they could be a problem, climate change uh, and land system change. So, so that was the planetary boundaries. The idea that we got to watch because if there's fundamental change in these areas, that presents a problem for, for humanity as a whole. Um, social scientists uh, were also interested in this idea. And this is a very famous plot, the, ox, the, the donut um, that Kate Rayworth, at, uh, who was at Oxfam at the time, came up with which she said, well, look, okay, you've, you've looked at the ecological bit, the planetary bit, but what about the human part? So she said, look, yes, there might be this ecological ceiling that you don't want to go past in terms of the well-being of the planet. But just the same, there is a, a, a foundation, a basement, a social basement we don't want to drop below in terms of the, the human dimension. So you see the water, food, health, education, peace and justice, etc., social equity, gender. And so the point was that we can't drop below a certain uh, level. We can't go extend beyond a certain level. And inside that donut is what they came to refer to as the safe and just space for humanity. That's the operating space that humanity um, is expected to, to live in. So it's a really nice fusion, if you like, from the geoscience perspective and also the social science perspective. And um, the, the, the donut economics of Kate Rayworth has become hugely, hugely um, influential in, in thinking, economic thinking. So what happened then was that um, people started to try to, you know, you've got these different competing frameworks that's coming in. And people started to try to build them together because to, for the follow-up for the Millennium Goals. So this is one, for example, from the Rio Plus 20 uh, conference um, that tries to take the, uh, what was emerging as the, the, the potential new goals, um, which we felt as small planet goals initially, which would be the follow-up to the Millennium Goals, and kind of put them on, graph them onto Daly's Triangle. So you'll see there that at the bottom, that uh, the ultimate means will be biodiversity and ecosystems. Then up, further up, it's about water and energy, which kind of then transitions into as, a, as an intermediate means to then produce other things like food. And it builds up and builds up. And then we have at the top poverty and inequality being seen as uh, an intermediate end starting to get into the ultimate ends of, of human well-being. Um, at the same time, the, you'll notice no, nothing about planetary boundaries there. There's a paper by David Griggs and colleagues in, in Nature in 2013 that tried that if you look at the, the, the diagram, the nested circles, it kind of rather looks like a, you know, the structure of the Earth diagram. They, the idea is that notion of the economy, sitting within society, and then sitting within Earth's life support system, and that being a fundamental part. And so they took the Millennium Goals, and said, we're going to need to combine this with the planetary boundaries to develop these sustainable development goals. And it's interesting that they then reworked the Brundtland uh, definition uh, and made it for the Anthropocene. So that it then became development that meets the needs of the present uh, while safeguarding Earth's life support system on which the welfare of current and future generations depends. So trying to embed the geoscience understanding into this notion of sustainability and, and development. So all of these competing ones, what did we end up with? Well, we end up with this. This is the very iconic sustainable development goals. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen them in some guys. Um, governments, uh, are signed up to these corporations, universities. Most companies will be, you know, part of the, the narrative within a company around sustainability is how are we doing for the sustainable development goals, which are the UN's aspirations between 2015 and 2030. And so you'll see some familiar things. In 17 uh, uh, go overall goals, we'll see the, what that's made up of in just a second. Um, but you, you'll see there's a mixture of development issues in there, social issues, 
uh, and you'll see a few environmental things uh, coming through. But it's not a simple uh, division. In fact, this diagram shows that. This is the 17 goals along the top with all of the different targets. There's a, something like 170 different targets. And they're color-coded here, depending whether they're ostensibly an environmental target or a social target or an economic target. And the point is that every one of those goals is um, an amalgam of social and environmental and economic. You can't, you can't tease them apart. And that's really important to, as a way of trying to signal the interdependence and interconnectedness of these challenges, these wicked, in terms of very difficult to solve challenges around poverty and, and the rest. Um, but I think what happens then is that there's a number of interesting things that, that spill out of this. Um, so one criticism of the SDGs has been, they're a bucket list of asks, but where is, what is the ultimate ask? What is the ultimate purpose of the SDGs? Where is the compelling narrative that drives forward this notion of what is it the world is trying to achieve by the end of these 17 goals and 170 odd targets? And so this notion of having um, a compelling narrative is that the, the way that the goals are set out, by almost being able to just kind of pick and choose, I'll have this one, I'll do this one, doesn't really suggest the need to be acting collectively in some, in some um, holistic uh, manner. And so other narratives have had to be derived. So this is one that uh, Rockstrom and this um, Stockholm Resilience Centre put together, uh, trying to put food, for example, at the centre of the goals and saying, um, well, actually, you know, food derives from the biosphere, and you can see some of the goals related to the biosphere. It then moves through society, and then it has an economic aspect, and eventually gets to people. And I'm sure you're already thinking that looks kind of like a daily's triangle in, in a way, the way that it's kind of stacked up there. So people have had to invent their own narratives to carry through the SDGs. The SDGs don't give their own clear narrative itself. The other aspect that I think is important is something that's come along kind of in, par in parallel is a fundamental questioning of that Milton Friedman economic paradigm that dominated the 20th century and free market economics, where the idea was profit maximization is the aim of business and that profit then will be used for shareholders and will trickle down and will get to the base and will drive uh, well-being. Well, what we see is a huge gulf in social inequity and, and, and environmental inequity, which means that it seems like that system has not delivered well-being in the way that economists thought it would. So economists have started to revisit this and say things like, GDP, gross domestic product, is not a very efficient way of actually looking at how successful a company or a national economy is, and we need to think about well-being. Now, there's five countries, Scotland, Wales, um, Iceland, Finland, and New Zealand, have actually kind of brought into the legal frame this notion of trying to judge the success of their economy through this idea of, the, of well-being. And again, there's indices that I look at what well-being means. This is the one from the Scottish uh, National Performance uh, Framework that talks about the different sectors. So there has to be inclusion, growth, and sustainability. And you, you'll see there the different sectors that have to contribute to it. So the well-being economy now is starting to be used as a template for businesses as well and corporations to say, you know, we, we can't anymore just say that just making a profit is for our shareholders is the end, is the purpose of business. The purpose of business is to deliver well-being. That's its, its purpose and we then need a new way to do it. So that is, that's something that's starting to argue in the economic uh, kind of sphere. But what it does do is it starts to bring back into focus, really, this notion of a daily in, in his triangle. And so what we see in the left is an attempt to very explicitly combine um, the SDGs with daily's triangle. And so this is the way that I would certainly, in the, in the right-hand side, the way that I would see daily's triangle today, that, um, as, and it reflects it's a lot of his the, the basic way he portrayed it, ultimate means is, the natural capital, those raw natural resources that we absolutely depend on that deliver these intermediate means uh, um, and then deliver these intermediate ends of profit. And then, then what we do with that profit, how we transform it into well-being is a key point. So the, just the, what, what is interesting when you look at it this way, you start to realize that some of the narratives around sustainability are actually locked into just certain parts of this triangle. So, for example, when we hear about, you know, worries over deforestation and cutting down the Amazon, or we, we start to look at the loss of water quality in a particular place, 
we're, we're really focusing on that green bottom part of resource sustainability or environmental sustainability, the sustainability of that natural capital system. Um, the, and another, but the other hand, we hear narratives around the green economy, around the energy transition, around the circular economy, you know, about driving sustainability. And geoscience has been pulled into this as been a, a critical part. But that really is only addressing that middle part of this thing about the intermediate means and ends. So it's a, it can allow business as usual to continue, but just in a, in a slightly more efficient way. The fundamental um, aspect that's missing in a lot of this is what are we doing about well-being, that, about the actual human well-being? Where, where is this getting driven from? And that's starting to emerge around social uh, business, social purpose for businesses like, um, I don't know, Unilever, uh, uh, Innocent Drinks, Ben and Jerry's. Ben and Jerry's say, oh, we're a social enterprise. We just happen to make ice cream. You know, These are companies that have got a social environmental mission, very strong. They use profit, of course, and the profit then gets used to drive their, their essentially their environmental uh, mission, which is about improving well-being. So to my mind, sustainability is the whole thing. It's that whole triangle. It's not just any individual part of it. And we need to think about this interconnections and that holistic system if we're really going to start to move our well-being. Now, another thing with the SDGs is where are those planetary boundaries? You know, this was emerging really as a strong theme, but actually it's very hard to find them. So if you go through the SDGs, you can see elements of them. If you remember right, rightly, the two critical ones were biosphere integrity and uh, biochemical flows. Well, biosphere integrity is 15.5, and I'll read it out to you. Take urgent and significant action to reduce the degradation of natural habitats, um, protect and prevent extinction of threatened species. And biochemical is there under 2.4, a little bit about, uh, about uh, resilient agricultural practice and 14.1 on reducing marine pollution. Now, the th perhaps you would read them as planetary boundaries. I'm not sure I would, but more importantly, they are three of 170 targets we have. The, the priority, the importance of these as fundamental thresholds in the planetary system really don't come through within the SDGs. They seem like they're just like another of these uh, uh, kind of priorities that we could, we could have or we might not have by 2030. But this is what it means. These are some of the, the this is from Tim Lenton, the paper by Tim Lenton in, in, uh, in 2013, where he just, they lay out really what are the fundamental um, sticking points in the planet that really could uh, mess things up big time. And you, these are familiar to you, the permafrost up in, in the, the Arctic, the Amazon rainforest, the, um, the, uh, the North Atlantic global uh, circulation system, the coral reefs, et cetera, et cetera. So what's unclear to me is how the SDGs help us track how are we doing on keeping ourselves inside some of these uh, planetary tipping point because the SDGs are set up as a development tool to allow it's still set up with that thinking that development is what's really going to get us out of this and we don't really need to think of the environment in an explicit way and I think that's not necessarily the case so to my mind the SDGs were setting up for for obviously 2030 we need to try our best to to hit those SDGs um, but at the same time not lose sight of the the much deeper, more profound uh, questions around the planetary boundaries that we need to, to stay within. And this is from a, a recent report by the Rockstrom Group 2019 that says, you know what, we're probably not going to reach the SDGs in 2030 or even in 2050. So the danger is that we're going to slip and it might well be that we end up meeting some SDGs that in terms of a planetary perspective are not that important and miss some of the ones that are actually fundamentally important. So to my mind, this require, really, really requires a, a big effort on the geoscience community to really start to address this. And in fact, when I was doing some of the research for this, there was a lot of discussion early on about whether there should be a, a, a specific SDG, a whole planet SDG that was around planetary integrity and was going to be underpinned by global uh, legal requirements around the environment. And I know that probably many of you know that there's moves around um, to get ECOSIDE, for example, into the international uh, 
criminal court as you know if you have a crimes against the, the, the loss of of a deliberate loss of environment and that you could get charged for ecocide but this is broader this is starting to put a legal basis to people's misuse of, of the of the planet as i say at that big integrated scale so i think it's at a big integrated scale that geoscientists really need to have a contribution and this really comes through here in this diagram again from tim linton and colleagues which is kind of kind of a scale of, of our trajectory out of this nice world of the Holocene, where agriculture and civilization flourished, you know, with rising CO2 uh, levels and rising temperatures, sitting on this precipice of about to roll into a future which could swing in to a role of uh, to a future of rampant unsustainability, where we where we continue with economic growth and material consumption and all the rest, but or whether we can actually. Um, rain back on that and deliver this safe and just operating space uh, for humanity. And so that is the huge challenge that we, we now face. And so um, I just wanted to uh, kind of finish really with this, uh, this point that, that this is really the start of a conversation. It's the start of a conversation around um, how does geoscience actually start to deliver some of this uh, work? And, during lockdown, because I had nothing else to do, really, I started working a little bit with some folks at BHP, and we started just chatting to geoscience people around the world, interviewing them, and and putting, we've been putting some of these interviews out as a as a place to get thought leaders to start thinking this. And usually, these are people that are seniors, so they're not it's not the new generation, but the people who are spending a lot of time thinking about this issue. And actually, I'm just if I just stop sharing for a second and then restart it, but optimize it for the video clip. And then we'll get back and I'll try to see if this is, oh, why does it not want me to do that? Let's just play this then and see. It's uh, just a few minutes long. So hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Yeah, I think geoscience has an incredible and growing role. There's a geologist somewhere in just about everything that we do. The single largest challenge that's out there that we know of for society for the next 30 years is how do we grow a prosperous world while taking care of the world at the same time. And it's, it touches everything from... How do we make the world safer? You know, impact the, studies, earthquake studies. Climate, environment, to land use. How do we access fresh water? It's going to become massive. How do we access fresh water? Guess what? As geologists, we know where the water is. How we view resources and the need for resources and our ability to extract them. To you know, how do you design something to withstand climate change? Because there's, there's so many things that we can solve with geology. So I think that the uh, the solutions that geoscience needs to contribute to is the energy transition. How do we provide better access to energy? How do we use what we have now in a more sustainable way? These are all questions that geoscientists are going to answer. No one really knows how to get there. I mean, um, and we need help. And so there's a huge invitation for folks to help us figure out how to um, accelerate this, this energy transition. Be it from the oil and gas side, actually being able to close down fields, etc., in a responsible manner, through to critical minerals, uh, geothermal, carbon capture use and storage to on the mining side extracting all of those minerals and metals that are absolutely fundamental for renewable power sources be it rare earth elements lithium etc cobalt renewable energy is interesting the sun and the wind are renewable heat and light and motion but the stuff to extract extract that energy isn't so wind turbines and solar panels and and batteries aren't renewable. There's nothing renewable about them. We mine them, we manufacture them, they wear out, we dispose them in landfills or recycle and we do it again. So that is so critical for people to begin to understand. People really, really high up in decision-making systems sort of say, wow, you know, no one talks about mining anymore, surely, you know, now, you know, we're just gonna recycle. The circular economy simply cannot achieve those things. You can't replace the electricity system of a planet by recycling the wires that are already in the ground. It's not going to happen. And so there's this enormous misconception that, that you know, recycling is good, mining is bad. Any future that has less carbon in it 
has got a whole lot more mining in it. An EV has got four times the amount of copper in it than a conventional IC, ICD-driven motor. So things like copper will be critical, things like lithium, cobalt, nickel, et cetera. What we look like to the public is something from 50, or, you know, 50 years ago. We, we look like we're, yeah. we're out there to um, rape and pillage the planet. How does geoscience play into the reinvention of mining so that it is a net positive activity on every dimension you can think of, socially, environmentally, from an energy point of view, from a political point of view, from an, from an economic point of view. It's not about a good job for 30 years working for a company. It's about doing something that is transformational for the world. I think other science has to be increasingly people-centric. Like geosciences is really important if you want to play a key role in, you know, the betterment of others. As a geoscientist, you really can change the world because it's you that is making the decision with regards to how responsibly you, you do your trade, as it were. Also, you are appealing to something which I think is rising up more maybe in the younger generation is that social awareness strand. And that's the kind of connection I think that geoscience is, is a natural connection to what geoscientists do um, and how they will help enable the world that's in front of us in a way that's totally different from the way it was done over the last 30 years, because it will be, it's a bigger problem. Geoscientists are earth scientists. We understand earth processes. We can address humanity's challenges and be excited about new discoveries. You can make the world a better place. The big challenges that we face, those are humanity's problems. And if, if there's any science that really is, is kind of, I think, could have an impact, globally that it's it's geology you know it gives you that context of, of your you know humanity's place in the universe but you kind of understand also that the earth is unique in many ways for our for our species and we better take care of it so i just that to wrap that up really i think that what, what i think we need to do is to start a conversation about what sustainability means for geoscientists and what our role and contribution is. There's little doubt that the energy transition, carbon capture storage, and, th and these things are going to be some of the, the key elements in our armory about how geology is going to help humanity. But I think it limits us if we just put it into that white space of intermediate means and ends. We clearly have a role to play in making sure that we've got the environmental baselines to protect the ultimate means. But I think the challenge that really hasn't been addressed is the one about well, how does geology develop the social purpose, you know, the social development that actually Im fundamentally improves human well-being. It's not just giving to the, the economic development, but it's actually enhancing social development. And that's around things like equity, uh, diversity, inclusion, many of the issues that seems quite far away from, from geology. Um, and, and I bring it back, and I think that, you know, re recapturing essentially what was in Hutton's mind way back in the 1788s when it was all about fundamental advancing human progress. It's got something to do with it, that, that really that is, I think, what the, the mission that Hutton sitting in that little farmhouse to the, to the east of Edinburgh really had in his mind about where he saw the science of geology going. And so I'll, uh, I'll, on that note, I'll, I'll leave it with you. I'll thank you very much from Jordan and I'll stop sharing and take any questions. Many thanks, Ian. Thanks very much for, for the time uh, you've given and spent on, on bringing this a wonderful, wonderful, thought-provoking presentation this evening. I see we have a couple of questions coming in, but, um, but just to sort of, you know, in terms of a, a whistle-stop tour of, you know, human development <laughs> from the Industrial Revolution to date, and then all of the challenges that face international governments in terms of wrestling with what is an appropriate outcome or benefit uh, and the changes that are required to take you through from A to B and, and how that sits with, as you say, planetary tipping points, which are you know, literally challenges that are for, for all of us. Um, and of course, finishing then off with your, your final video with a lot of familiar faces, which would be a wonderful advert for, for a geoscience careers fair, uh, never mind. Um, 
But, you know, I, there's a load of questions that I have here, but that's not um, appropriate for me. I can use my license perhaps later. It's it's best that I platform some of the questions that are coming in from our delegates who are here this evening. So if I may, um, we have one of our first questions is from Miguel. And it's asking, what is your opinion on the possibility that geosciences have a different meaning on sustainability among groups, amongst research groups or institutions in comparison with other fields of knowledge? Maybe yeah, I think, that, there, yeah. I think that's why it needs to be a conversation, you know. So I know, I mean, I, the, even up to the last few years at my university department, which was fairly progressive, but I think very representative, we weren't talking about sustainability. We weren't talking about sustainable development. It never appeared. It didn't appear in first year. It didn't appear with no courses on it. I think I did a review a few years ago, and there was one geology course in the UK when I went through all of the courses that had the word sustainable or sustainable development in the title of it. Now, that's not the case now. We've got a professor of, of sustainable geoscience in Chris Jackson up at Manchester. We've got a, you know, Cardiff just advertised last week, or we filled a position last week with Joe Gill going to, to Cardiff for the lectureship in sustainable geoscience. It's starting to happen. But I think we haven't quite had that conversation yet about what it means, exactly what the question is, what does it mean to us? And if you go to, as I, you know, I attend quite a lot of the, in the industry bashes on conferences and things like that, you'll often find a session on sustainability, but often it's financial sustainability, or often it's the sustainability of reducing the carbon footprint of operations, you know, or things like that. It's, it's about making efficiencies in the way we do things as our contribution, but there's a deep paradox there because it's geoscientists that have, un, have really grasped the profundity of the threat that's there so this is this is putting a plaster onto tiny little things where we know huge action is needed so i think that we are we are failing society as geoscience if we do not look at that big picture and say we you know as, as denise cox said that we are earth scientists we understand the earth our, our approach has to be at that scale if we're going to be meaningful in this. Uh, and I'm not sure, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not sure that those discussions are happening in undergraduate courses and professional development courses in industry all around the world, because I don't hear it happening. But Okay, Ian. And then Miguel, sort of the second part of his question is when you're focused on the 2030 agenda and the fact that working with such indicators means they can be manipulated or misinterpreted. Um, the question is how geosciences can foster good practice in this respect? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's very, I th what will happen, of course, as well, as we, as we approach 2030, and it's already, you know, it's only eight years away, uh, is to start to get a disillusionment about how impossible these targets are and, and that. And I think the way, to, the way that I uh, internalize it, 20, 30 goals, is it's a direction of travel. This is, this is where we want to go. And, you know, I sometimes get pushed back when I give a talk like amongst geoscientists. We say, oh, it sounds all very fantastical and all oh, well, really wonderful. But, you know, is it very realistic? And you say, well, your company and your, your you know, university and your government has signed up to delivering on these SDGs. This is, this is part of corporate reality that we're now rightly or wrongly. So they may seem fantastical, but those targets are being set and, and legally binding in many cases and people are reporting against them. So I think what we need to do is within our organizations is really have a hard look at what our purpose is in achieving them. An individual organization, even an individual university, will not be able to address all of those, those ones. Which ones should it do? You know, where are the ones, where's its strengths, and which are the ones it can really make a meaningful difference to and, and go for them. But, but what tends to happen is it falls into you know, marketing departments and people flag certain activities and budget is something, and it, 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 there's a sense of it's moving forward. And then when we measure it, it you know, they seem as far away as ever. So I, again, I mean, I, I do sense some despondency around the extent to which we're going to get to the SDGs. But I think if we see that the direction of travel is right, you know, we're, we're so used to seeing exponentials in the natural system. And also we see it obviously in the human system that if we really, really start to motivate towards this, I think we will see change. But we need to, again, start to really have serious conversations around it. 
Okay, and I think, yeah, I think some of those hard conversations have definitely started. Uh, we mm -hmm. have our next question. I'm, I'm okay to, to use this name because I know Kuhn well. So Kuhn Verbruggen, the Director of the Geological Survey of Ireland um, and Chair of the Academy's Committee on Geoscience and Geographical Sciences, asks, given the sustainability challenges you have laid out, where should government geoscience or geological surveys be putting their efforts? Traditionally, their role was to map and manage, you know, natural resources. So where to now? Um, yeah, thanks, Kun. I think it's a, it's it's exactly the question I'm asking myself because I think whether I'm in, I mean, the Royal Scientific Society is not a university; it's an academic organisation. What, what is the role of those organisations? And the way that I, I really like Daly's Triangle for this reason because it's a way of always mapping what we do. So, for example, I know the survey, uh, and I I'm, so think, thinking of the survey and thinking of uh, the RSS at my end, some of our activities is very much on those environmental baselines. So, some of our activities are just protecting the environment, tracking change, looking for pollution, et cetera, whatever it is. So, it's very clearly that resource sustainability. Um, but increasingly, we are getting asked to help uh, you know, industry be more efficient, materials, batteries you know, renewable energies, et cetera, bringing on that stuff. And that puts us very much in the mainstream of this, the energy transition and the, and the, the circular economy. And again, that has to happen. So, and, and some of our activities just sit in there. So I would say to, to Kuhn, as I say to my boss here, um, that's fine. What activities are we doing that actually pushes into the, to the ultimate? ends area of delivering manageable measurable tangible improvement of human well-being what are we doing are we just helping and doing our bit for industry and then assuming the same um, kind of mantra that by companies becoming more profitable that they'll do the job of well-being so i think that in an organizational sense every organization should be able to point to some of the things that either go all the way through from green through white to black do the whole thing or to, to have specific activities whereby they're really improving human well-being. So a good example is what the British Geological Survey is doing, for example, with, well, Joel, Joel's left now to go to Canada, but particularly the group that's been working in East Africa around water uh, development and, and energy there and geothermal and things. You know, that there's work that is not rocket science, but it actually can demonstrably change the quality of community life and, and individuals' life in certain parts of the world. It's not very profitable, probably, uh, in that sense, but in a big organization, having that portfolio, I think, is important. But I suspect the really critical ones is, what are we doing that actually goes from protecting that natural, the ultimate means of the biosphere, through working with industry to make their work more important, and therefore pushing into the area at the top and making sure that the people we work with or stakeholders are actually also improving well-being as well and that's a that's a, a more difficult task let's see okay great um we have another question um following on from your example of hydrogeology and irish hydrogeologist malcolm doak um a couple of acronyms but uh, esg is huge Every day it's a feature in the financial time, presumably financial times. Geoscience can and should use this as a sustainable development goal language. That's what I yeah. suppose more of a statement, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think that the only trouble with the ESG, it's ESG of course, so environmental, social uh, uh, governance, um, various words creep in, but um, yeah, it's, there's no doubt that in the industry it's huge. But, but the danger is it gets used as virtue, virtue signaling and doesn't actually move the dial. So I think if ESG is coming in and it has to come in, it's, it's legislative now and lots of companies you know, have to sign up against it. It can't just get used as a fob to, to submit how amazing we've, we've got. Again, I think these things have to be measurable. We have to set targets against it. This is what we mean by this. And, and that, this is where the well-being bit's useful. Because you, you can see our ESG will deliver these well-being targets and we'll measure our progress against them. And, you know, a lot of companies now, um, some really big resource companies, the, the salaries of their chief executives are tied to reducing their carbon emissions. And if they're not hitting those very clear targets, then they're not doing it. And we need to do that with ESG. <laughs> so ESG, you know, if you look at you know, some of those goals, gender equality, for example, well, ESG is a critical one uh, for being able to do that. So I think the geoscience companies, by and large, do a really good job, particularly the global ones, particularly the major ones, like shareholders and all the rest of it. 
So they can be using the work, the activity to, to genuinely show how you can make a difference and how a more diverse, inclusive workforce is actually a much more fertile, imaginative, creative environment to, to do lots of amazing things. And not just because you can say we've got 51% female, 49% male, aren't we really good kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's still a huge body of work to do when it comes to diversity um, in geosciences globally. Uh, as, as Chris Jackson and, and colleagues have been uh, encouraging. Um, we have a couple, two questions here, but I'm going to take the <laughs> license of trying to, to shorten. So from David Crickall. Um, what ways do you see that are still open for civilization to bend the current trajectory away from hothouse earth? In other words, how can we repurpose geoscience together with educational policy and practice for some kind of well-being for life on earth? Thanks, David. Um, yes, that is the ultimate one. I mean, so, so, he, so there's an interest, I'm going to slightly segue around because um, I guess I'll answer it in two different ways. If I tackle it head on, geoscience has to find its social purpose. It found its economic purpose a long while ago. It's demonstrated it can do that. What is its social purpose? And you know, clearly that's not, you know, geoscience doesn't get together for one party a year and decide these things. So this is across the geoscience community within the academic sector. But we start having to have that discussion. What is it, what is it we're really going to be? So you could look at, and some people would argue, well, our contribution, if you want to look at the ultimate one, would have to be carbon capture storage. If we can, you know, if we have negative carbon, drawing carbon out the atmosphere, and we can lock it away in our, either our saline aquifers or our depleted oil fields, then surely that's fantastic. So that would work, except I don't see the political will and the public will, and even the industry and academic will for large scale carbon capture storage at the pace and scale that we need it to happen. So if we all got together and decided that that was our thing that could do it, I think the one that I could see more is water. You know, I can see that in 2050, what, you know, I'm in Jordan, third most water scarce part of the, of the globe. Jo I, I, think, I think it was Laura Tyler at BHP said it in that video. We can find water. You know, all the techniques we use for oil and gas, finding oil and gas and things like that, we can use the same thing to find water. So if you're, you know, oil and gas geologist and you're going to parties and getting, you know, your ear torn off because you're told you're terrible for the planet, you know, those exact same technical skills could be found in underground water in Africa in 10, 20 years. And who knows, maybe the value of water is going to be way more. So we need to start thinking more broadly about what it is we can really deliver. And, you know, isn't it crazy in the UK? I mean, hydrogeology has almost a bit disappeared in, uh, in the UK. I mean, the master's courses and stuff. And yet it seems to me that if you were going to look at one geoscience area that we're going to need is that one. And so mm -hmm. where is the, again, if the community recognizes this, then starting to really put some energy into that and say, no, this is critical for us and we need to develop it. But at the moment, we're, we're chasing all over the place. We're, we're mm -hmm. trying to develop a little bit of CCS but our heart's not really in it. We're, we're trying to develop geothermal, but we know the scale of that's going to be operable in certain places, not going to apply everywhere. We're trying to chase critical minerals because of renewables, but we can see all the problems with mining and the disillusion and the disenchantment with mining. So all of them seems to be almost, um, you know, partial gains that we can do. And I think it's partly because we not sat back and looked at the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll use that mining link that you had as part of your, your summation there, Ian. A uh, question here from Mary Orr. With the focus on carbon, are we creating a different problem? As said in the video, you know, electric vehicles needing cobalt, lithium, etc. Yeah, I, I think to some extent we are. I mean, I like um, uh, uh, John in the, uh, uh, Ron in the video said, you know, a future with a lot less carbon in it is going to have a lot more mining in it. You know, we're going to have to dig up a lot of stuff. And I, I really don't think the public, the politicians have grasped that. And Karen said something very similar. So, so I think the public thinks that it can get away with recycling and reuse and all the rest of it. Um, it's pretty clear that in Europe, there was a recent thing in Serbia where they kicked out, was it Rio? They, they didn't let them in. It was for, for, for lithium. Um, in Europe, we really don't like holes opening up in the, our backyard. We're against it. But equally, we're very much against our companies going across to, you know, Central Africa and, and, get, and getting that. So something's got to give. 
So I, I think that that is one of the huge debates, and it's not really a geology debate. I mean, it's a, it, there are technical aspects to it, but it's a moral, mm -hmm. ethical, public debate that geoscientists should be involved in mm -hmm. um, about where are we going to get the stuff that was going to produce this low carbon world. But I don't think geologists should get all um, smug about this and think, well, you're going to have to come around to this later. I mean, I think we need great humility and say, this is a huge problem. Where, where do you want us? What do you want us to do? You know, we're technical. We can go and do whatever we, we find, it, whatever you tell us. But we need to engage in a genuine debate about this rather than the fact that we think we've got all the cards and eventually they'll come calling to us and, and, and we'll be right after all. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, Dan. Thank you. Next question is from um, Professor Jenny McElwain, who chairs the Academy's Climate Change and Environmental Science Committee. So she's focused on planetary boundaries. So do you think that the Paris Climate Agreement sufficiently addresses the concept of planetary boundaries? And do you think we know enough about planetary boundaries? And geosciences can, of course, help us to understand where these are, but many are currently not completely understood. I would, I, no, no, yes. Uh, so no, I don't think the climate, Paris Climate Agreement, well, the Paris Climate Agreement falls short on a whole bunch of areas, but um, it, it's a good, you know, I mentioned the SDGs, but it's actually quite hard. So there was a huge, one of the other things you realise as you research it is that there's a huge debate about where climate should sit in the SDGs because you had the IPCC. So they, they didn't want there to be this two different voices around climate. But what you'll see is, the Climate Action SDG is probably the weakest of all the SDGs. And that's because the IPCC is seen to be driving that area, but it means it's kind of a bit toothless in the SDGs. And, and But even in the Paris Climate Agreement, yeah, I, I, it's hard to know how these planetary boundaries fit in. It is also hard to know, you know, what we talk about, we understand the planet, but actually some of the baselines, we just don't have enough granularity, understanding of those baselines to really know if we stepped over a threshold. And so I, I think that um, the, but this type of system, systemic thinking around the planet, the interconnectedness, I mean, this has been one, one of the unsung really revolutions in geoscience over the last 20, 30 years. I remember when Lovelock came out with Guy and everyone thought he was this nutty mythologist that was doing it, uh, the Joel Sock, gave them a, a medal, but it was all about our system science. And, but the connect, interconnectedness of the world, all geoscientists would, uh, you know, expect, you know, now just assume that that's what we do. But really driving at that to, as a way of how do we tackle that critical question? So, I, and I suspect that the, that the planetary boundaries works at one level, but actually when you start to pin it down into a target, that's probably why it probably fell out of climate uh, uh, Cap Paris and fell out of the SDGs because it's very difficult to say what that level of whatever it is that's going to sit, send us, you know, over the line and, and, and into the chasm. Okay, many thanks. Um, moving just to something, <laughs> they're all big, as you can imagine, when you're dealing uh -huh. with them, they're all big. So this one from Giuseppe, who I'm, I'm sure you know well. Uh, hi Ian, how much are we as geoscientists prepared to a paradigm shift in the way in which we use nature? Yeah, yeah, I, I, think, the, I think that's a really critical question because, so when I was teaching geology, we used to have this big argument all the time because we, we follow in the footsteps of the people that taught us. So we always used to be this big argument about what made a geology degree. I mean, for example, mapping. Should they have independent mapping? Should they have petrology, crystallography, you know? There was always these battlegrounds around what it is that makes a geologist. And it was always framed in these technical skills that almost we were carrying this, this baton, you know, that we picked it up from our predecessors and we were teaching this new generation and they were going to carry on. It was really important to get that continuity. And I think what that missed was the, the world fundamentally changing amidst all of that. So now we have this, this difficult situation where we've got all these amazing technical skills, but which one of them are actually going to be operable and useful uh, coming? And I think what we've lost are these bigger sense of skills around critical thinking, sy systems thinking, um, and fundamentally recognizing that what we deal with is uncertain you know what geologists do is incredible with the amount of data points you know one of your geology maps 
if you strip that off and you just look at the actual data points that that geology map has been created in, in some parts of, of, the, of the UK and Ireland covered in vegetation, agricultural field, it's extraordinary we even came up with the geology map, but we can do it because that's our mindset. But I, I think those are the skill sets that we're actually going to need to do. And I, and, and I think that the, the early geologists, and there still are people who are thinking of this big planetary ethics type of side of things. This is where Giuseppe is coming from. I, you know, geoethics is not something that generally is taught or discussed in geology departments. Why not? What is our role mm -hmm. as, as earth stewards? I mean, I remember uh, in a program talking about earth stewards and earth exploiters and getting criticized with this false dichotomy. But what I was really getting at was it was a continuum of you know, you've got the earth exploiter here and you've got the earth steward here. And most of us are in the middle mm -hmm. with a little bit of both trying to trying to get by. But we need those discussions and probably we need them in, you know, first year as students come in to say, why, what have you, come, what the hell have you come into? What is mm -hmm. the subject you've taken on for the next three years? Instead, we tend to then talk about these technical skills and it's been added now with data science and big data and drones and all of this stuff. But that's not going to be where it's won or lost. It's going to be one of those big ethical ones, especially if we want the best people to come into geoscience. Because at the moment, it feels like a 20th century science that's had its day. And that these other, you know, quantum computing and, you know, all of this other, these kind of fancy stuff is, is really the future. Um, and it's absolutely critical. The fundamental questions are issues that will define the future of humanity are geoscience issues. And if you're not <laughs> going to have the smartest people around doing it, then we're in a much harder place. Brilliant. Speaking of questions, we have 11 more <laughs> open and we've got <laughs> 10 minutes left. So um, Sean Finlay, Geoscience Ireland, so coming out from a, from a business perspective. Distrust of science is evident in advanced economies. And it gives the example of Ottawa protests and vaccination and climate issues. This is a major issue for geoscience as well, uh, and the need to further public understanding at every opportunity, if you wanted to comment on, on that. Well, I'd separate out the two things. I think that uh, there's, there's public understanding of science and how, you know, the facts of science, understanding of the scientific method and things like that. And then there's a way that people look through their, their own values and worldviews and norms, belief systems about what's right and what's wrong. What, what we're generally seeing in things around the anti-vax stuff is, is usually a, a political or a belief system things that says, I believe in this set of values and this doesn't match it. So it's not really a comprehension of science. It might get used that way. So maybe people might use the science or uncertainty around the science as the, as the reason, but if, whether it's climate change denial or anti-vax denial or something like that, as soon as you dig below, it's about freedom, it's about autonomy, it's, it's about some of these big, the big issues about the way you view the world. And that's not gonna go away. So, and we'll see that in geoscience as well. So I think that the mistake is to assume that if we just can explain the facts better, that somehow that group of people will just accept those facts. If someone is saying, particularly the anti-vax or the climate denier, that they've defined their, they define their view of, of that issue on the basis of their, their, their basic values. If you're asking them to, subvert or take away the basic values to accept your science mm -hmm. that takes away the whole identity mm -hmm. so you're asking people to, to pass up their identity for this so that is a really you know, that's not a place to to try to go to convince people so i think separating the two things out you know what we do about uh the kind of future we want is a moral ethical discussion where values and all the rest of it come into it there'll be bits of science but ultimately it's not so I think we need to try to be as clear as we can about how we comprehend the science and technical problems. And then we have to think about, and this is an individual thing, but it's also for an organization, how much do we want to steep ourselves in these ethical, moral questions and, and start to debate them? Because that's the place where we can start to influence the way that, that people fundamentally think about this kind of stuff. And the second one's much, much harder. Uh, and from an organizational point, standpoint, much more dangerous. Okay, anonymous question, um, and this is picking up, of course, on your expertise in communication, which we, we must avail of. Um, what role do you see for citizen science in engaging society to emphasize the benefit and relevance of geoscience in daily life? 
Well, it kind of depends what you mean by citizen, what the question means by citizen science. So I, think I see two think types of citizen science. I see those citizen science, which are, um, almost uses the citizens as a cheap labor force to collect lots and lots of data, to send it to the scientists so that they can publish research papers that the public have no way of actually accessing because it goes usually behind a paywall or in a conference. So I, I'm not a huge fan of that type of mass citizen science. What I am a huge fan of in trying to get more involved in is how can local communities genuinely develop partnerships and, and participate in science where their voices is, is heard and acknowledged and maybe shapes the process. So I learned a lot of this, you know, when fracking came along and, and then I started working on the geothermal from the social acceptance. The notion of trying to embed yourself in communities and on listening, genuinely listening to them and then trying to develop co-produce things, that is hugely exciting. And so I, that's citizen science as well. And that's the one I think that we definitely need more of. Brilliant. So here I'm picking up again on your, you know, your EDI and your geoethics commentary, which is obviously a key part of, of sustainability. Uh, this is from Deborah Dixon. So she's referring to the portfolio of carbon capture techniques as advocated in the IPCC, and it's etched into net zero promises. Uh, projects are being funded in the UK and elsewhere, but these are been hampered by a lack of geoethics. Do you think that foregrounds equality, diversity, inclusion? Uh, can geoethics be built into academia and governance? Oh, so top down. That's a great question, Deborah. Um, I'd really love to see it. Um, I think it's going to, you know, in front of Deborah's up in Glasgow, it's funny, it's probably going to be departments where it's got that social science, or, you know, human science and geoscience, and where we can probably start having those discussions. I definitely think we need an ethical thread going through um, geoscience, because I know uh, in people who are deeply, deeply worried about carbon capture storage, more from a, you know, the scaling up point of view, but just, you know, over the horizon from CCS is geoengineering, which brings in a whole bunch of other really scary things. So I think that it's, we're complicit in, we need to start having these ethical uh, debates. Now, I had this discussion about in, in Plymouth, and one of the things people said, well, I'm not, I can't, why can I teach this? I can't teach this. I'm not trained for that. So, so there are issues about how you do it. But to my mind, I think every geoscientist should be starting to think about this, what their position up in relative to these things. And, they, and as Chris Jackson said in there, you know, the things in universities, the new generation of students coming in are thinking completely different from mm -hmm. the way our generation was. They see a globally hyper-connected world and they want to make a difference. And they're shaping the way that courses run and all the rest of it. So, so geoscience has to adjust to that anyway. So I'd almost like have that because I think that that's a way of, under, of trying to understand what they want more rather than us trying to second guess which of our technical skills we need to kind of teach them. So yeah, hmm. yeah. Again, Ian, um, just we're in the last sort of four or five minutes. Um, there's a couple of questions, and they have an undercurrent of communications. And I suppose building on your talk and in particular the Earth Project video, and which you could say is geoscientists are very good at talking to each other. <laughs> you know, uh, what would be your call to action in terms of being able to bring that conversation out, you know, into the world and the best way of organizing ourselves to do that? You know, whether it be policy level, whether it be community level, whether mm -hmm. it be at educational level, do you have a call to action or a how-to in mind? Well, it's funny because, you know, I've always spent 15 years trying to talk to the public about it. But I know you know, those videos are, are for geoscientists. You know, they're, they're, they're not, if you're not really interested in geology or you don't think you're interested in geology, you're not really going to watch them. So what I'm hoping, and I can, uh, I'll, it's called geosciencefutures.org and you can, you can find it out there. And we just put up Chris Jackson's one last week. So I think what they do is they start conversations amongst geoscientists. So that's one audience. I think the other audience is thinking, who are the critical points of influence you know we all talk about policy makers who are they business leaders who are they so some of the th and the, in some cases if it's to do with certain um tasks it, it will be communities so i think that my I, i'm kind of moving away from this blanket public communications of trying to reach everyone because you get a very superficial message which is usually isn't the planet amazing and we've done all that and people know it. so it's trying to be a lot more targeted and it's a lot, and, and actually the process of communication is harder because you have to spend a lot of time listening and understand that audience you want to reach and then going back and designing your communications to then do it. So it's a protracted process. 
but it's the one that I'm now going to spend most, most of my time doing rather than banging a drum to try and reach millions because I think you end up selling planet Earth. And that's, I think, is not helping us have these, these genuine dialogues about which direction of travel we should go in. Uh, I think maybe I'll maybe use this as a final question um, because it's back to that, um, you know, from a distance, you know, mm. beautiful blue ball spec. Um, uh, do you think that perhaps more insight and communication and partnering with, for example, ESA and NASA astronaut geoscientists can help generate the urgency of planetary boundary discussions? So more interaction as primary people do to help discuss. Yeah, I think I think it probably does. I mean, Earth observation is a, a massive thing and a massive element of, of the tracking of a lot of these issues and it gives huge scale. But there's also, what worries me a little bit is quite remote, it's the remoteness from it. So I think the hard thing with Earth observation is how do you take that amazing data sets you get and actually bring it in and embed it in local people? So I'll, I'll give you an example. We're starting to work here in, in Jordan on a, a water crisis problem of, of this Azraq oasis, which is an oasis in the northeast that in the 70s and 80s was a lake land. And then over pumping of groundwater to provide drinking water for a man and agriculture is basically it's a puddle now. Um, now there's lots of environmental data uh, around that extraction rates and all this stuff. You can see the, the, the water getting less and less and the quality and the salination coming up. But there's also communities living there that have stories to tell about how they're changing their lives as a result of this tremendous change. This, it's got nothing to do with them. It's gone off, you know, across the other side of the country to feed four and a half uh, million ammonites. So I think that one of the challenges, and I go back to this, is how do we integrate data and information facts, if you like, with stories that are compelling human narratives? And it's fusing them together that will be our most communication. So we can't ignore the facts and can't get rid of the facts, but the, the data and the facts are the the ingredients that, that sit within our stories, but they need to be human stories. And I'm trying to draw that out. So uh, Earth observation for the sake of it, no, but how Earth observation might illuminate human stories, yes. Brilliant, Ian. Well, um, that uh, has unfortunately brought, brought this to a close because there are still questions and hopefully maybe you might uh, be able to answer them. I know you have an event after this, so that's why I'm keen to, to keep the time that we've promised. But there may be some that you might be able to answer perhaps by email. But some of the thread is about the role of geoscientists in terms of mediators, the common denominator, and that we're interdisciplinary um, and working together in, in, you know, with social scientists, psychologists, economists and policymakers, uh, you know, to, as you say, towards a common effort. So I think there, it is a very um, collaborative science as demonstrated by the multi, <laughs> how multifaceted it is. And maybe that's, you know, a key skill in itself. Um, no, I just on that point, it's a really good point. We, we pride ourselves in our interdisciplinarity. You know, we steal from physics and chemistry and biology and maths and things like that. Well, what's the difference about stretching a little bit wider and stealing from the social sciences and the human sciences? You know, we can do that. We, we're the perfect, you know, thieves in, in, that, in that regard. Absolutely. And just to keep the balance with the humanities, of course, too, uh, as a representative of both scientists and humanities. So that leaves me to thank very much, uh, particularly the Royal Irish Academy, who have hosted this event, because we had to, for their support, we had to pitch and we're delighted to bring geoscience, you know, uh, to this platform this evening. And and we will also then, after the event, as, as you know, it's recorded, bring it so that it will there'll be a legacy for this talk on YouTube following this event. Our thanks to both uh, Geological Survey Northern Ireland, Geological Survey Ireland and UNESCO for their support for this event. And of course, colleagues and the chairs of the Geoscience and Geographical Sciences Committee and the Climate Change and Environmental Sciences Committee, Kuhn Verbruggen and Jenny McElwain. Uh, and of course, yourself, Ian, for your time. You're always very generous. Every time we ask you, you say yes. You're so good and you're... Uh, every time you know it's always brilliant and we really appreciate it we can't emphasize how much we appreciate how generous you are with your time you um, and also just finally northern ireland science festival is running at the minute uh, has been over the whole of february and i think this is probably one of the first royal irish academy um events that has been marketed by the northern ireland science festival and i'm sure our, our numbers are thanks to their um advertising so we, we really appreciate that in terms of the future we will stage another two events this year. Um, 
the next event will be, uh, they don't realize it yet, but it'll be from the recipient of the, the Royal Irish Academy Gold Medal in Environmental and uh, Climate Sciences. And that will be announced on Monday and none of us have any idea. So that's very exciting. Uh, and they will hopefully uh, give a talk sometime later in the spring. And then there'll be a third event, uh, which will come later in the autumn, probably towards September um, with, with Jenny and colleagues on the environmental science and climate science side. So two more brilliant events to look forward to. Uh, thanks again to all the team, to Sheila, to Carol, to Gronje. And of course, Ian, I wish you, hope you have a lovely evening. I know it hasn't finished yet. You're two hours ahead of us. I'm sure you'll be shattered by the time you get to rest, but we really appreciate it. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. And it's lovely to see all those familiar names in the, in the participants list. So, so we're, yeah, thanks to everyone for, for turning up. And thanks for inviting me, for reaching out. Brilliant. Thanks, All the best. Good night. Bye. Take care. Bye.